my pleasure to welcome you to today's Stefan Maki seminar, um, given by Tanya Kuteva, um, who is a professor of English linguistics in Düsseldorf in Germany, and also a research associate in our department, and a honorary professor next door, I believe, at UCL. Uh, is that still true? Well, uh, um, <laughs> I was a visiting professor yeah. at UCL, and I'm going to be also next mm -hmm. year, perhaps. <coughs> And um, it's also a very personal pleasure um, for me to have Tanya here because we go back a very long time. Um, That's right. Because I met Tanya when I was an undergraduate student of African <coughs> linguistics in Cologne, and she was a research associate there, working with Bernd Heine and pioneering their approach, um, combining grammaticalization and language contact in order to see how these two forces of kind of architectural properties of language and influences through contact <coughs> convert in shaping language. Um, and uh, so it's with great delight, really, that I introduce her today. And um, she is presenting uh, what? <laughs> or should I say what? <laughs> on well, what? I don't know. On on a, <laughs> yes, on a very, if not emotional, emotive uh, subject, on the emotive particle what in Singlish. And this is collaborative work, I was told, that really spans continents. <laughs> That's true. And uh, now the floor is yours. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you. Um, well, um, I've spent uh, wonderful and very rewarding months and years uh, here. It's always, so, uh, it's always a delight for me to be back. So thank you very much for the opportunity and uh, um, for the nice introduction as well. Um, so today I'm going to talk uh, on an emotive particle in Singlish. Singlish is the Singapore colloquial variety of English. Uh, and this particle is actually sentence final what, as used in Singlish. As uh, Frédéric mentioned already, uh, this is a, a joint work with uh, Sanghe Li from Hong Kong University, uh, Deborah Siegel uh, from um, uh, Paris, um, and uh, Jessica uh, Saban, uh, a PhD student of mine. Um, well, let me tell you a few uh, uh, words, first of all, about the structure of the presentation. After a very brief introduction, I'll be talking about uh, the Singlish sentence final what uh, from a synchronic perspective, then we'll take a diachronic perspective, and then we'll have a discussion. Uh, finally, we'll come to the conclusions um, of this study. I also have to say that this is an ongoing study. Um, so the object of investigation is uh, uh, what used at the end of the sentence in Singapore, colloquial English or Singlish. Um, now the primary function of this uh, particle is objection. Hence you um, come across the term the objection particle what uh, in the specialized literature. It is also referred to most of the time actually as um, <coughs> an emotive particle. Um, the, uh, uh, I mean the function, uh, objection, um, um, let me exemplify it to you uh, with this example here, uh, coming from uh, actually the most um, um, detailed and very insightful study of sentence final what in Singlish so far, a study uh, which was carried out in 1985 by Ian Smith. Um, the context that we have here is a discussion of a student who is going overseas for one month and missing classes. So we have A and B uh, talking about that, and A says he'll never pass the third year. Uh, but then B says um, it's only for one month what? So it is this use of what that we're going to discuss. Um, Smith describes uh, this use of sentence final what as an emotive particle, which uh, is characterized by the following features. First of all, which is its fixed position at the end of the sentence. Then you have intonation drop plus low pitch, and um, also some kind of indication that the speaker objects to something in the context. Um, now, the aim of uh, our study is uh, to actually unravel the mystery of this weird use of uh, what in uh, um, uh, Singlish. And we will do this, um, so we, we want to explain the synchronic behavior of uh, sentence final what um, 
in terms of its diachronic development and for this purpose we're also going to situate it uh, within a functional network of uses of interrogative what across languages uh, which are genetically and um, geographically related and unrelated. Um, so now, in previous studies, uh, Center's final um, what uh, has been treated as the result of language transfer from the local substrate languages such as Hokkien Chinese, for example, or Cantonese Chinese. Our proposal uh, differs uh, radically uh, from uh, this kind of treatment of the particle uh, because um, we, we propose that uh, Singlish sentence final what originated in the lexify, in the non-local uh, language, namely British English. And we also propose that it is the result of a process that started in British English and then went further on in um, Singlish. Um, so let me first give you some uh, very, very brief information on uh, Singapore colloquial English. Uh, this is the colloquial variety of Singaporean English. Um, now it is a nativized uh, contact dialect of English and uh, the current generation of um, Singlish speakers have acquired this language from infancy. This is the local vernacular and uh, since August last year it, it actually also has the status of one of the uh, five main languages spoken in Singapore. The major influences on this high contact variety come from uh, Chinese dialects but also we have influence from other Indian minority languages such as uh, Malay, uh, Bazaar Malay, Baba Malay, Tamil and other uh, minority languages spoken in India. Now let's come to uh, the second part which is um, we're going to take a look at the major uses uh, nowadays uh, in uh, Singlish, so that's our synchronic perspective on uh, the phenomenon we are investigating. And we have to say here that um, there are five basic uh, uses of uh, center's final word in Singlish. The first one, as I mentioned already, is objection. Then we have discontent, um, then uh, there is also the use um, for agreement, solidarity or appeal for agreement um, or solidarity. Then there is also the mitigating um, um, use of Sanders final uh, what as a mitigator. Uh, and um, number five, emphasis. Um, as a mark of objection, that's the, the, the first use. Um, um, there is another example here. Uh, this is from um, a, a conversation actually between the author of the study that I mentioned to you, Ian Smith, and his colleague in, in Singlish. She is a, a colleague who was collecting uh, authentic data from uh, Singlish about the use of uh, what. So Ian Smith is saying, um, if this is a real example, but then she uh, uh, says, uh, it is what? Yeah, well, I mean, it's, uh, to Julie, it sounds like the most natural thing in the world, right? To me, it didn't, um, at least uh, not when, sta when I started uh, studying this uh, use of um, um, what. Um, so, uh, the context is, as I said already, this discussion, and you see um, how what is used uh, to mark the objection of uh, person B um, who objects uh, to person A's, this is Ian Smith's doubt, that the example that this, uh, the, exa the example they're discussing might not be authentic. Um, then we have the second uh, use of Santa's final what, which is discontent. Um, and there is another uh, example. The context is a student wants to post a notice uh, on the notice board. So this is a conversation between the secretary and the student and the student says, can I have some pins R? Uh, well this R is one of the uh, very frequently used uh, emotive particles in, uh, in Singlish. Um, then the secretary um, says, notice board got pins what? Um, now the way that Ian Smith describes the use of what here is, 
Here the secretary brands the student's request as unjustified since there are thumbtacks available in the notice board. There is in addition the implication that the student should know this and therefore should not have felt necessary to ask in the first place. So something is very obvious, so why the hell are you bothering me with your question? Um, then we have the third function, namely um, what use as a marker of appeal for agreement or for solidarity. So we have um, uh, a sentence like, uh, not bad what, the show. Um, here what is very much like uh, attack um, um, question. Um, and obviously the speaker invites the interlocutor to assent. Um, then there is this, um, function of sentence final what as a mitigator, something used in order to tone down, to soften, to soften the, um, the statement made by the speaker himself or herself. So here is a conversation between A and B. Have you been to the restaurant? Yes, the food there is not bad what. Um, so the example uh, is, um, I mean, as I said, this is used in order to tone down or to subdue the speaker's own statement. Um, and you can paraphrase this by, in my opinion, I think so. And then we come to the final major use of sentence final what, namely, it is also a mark of emphasis um, in a context where we have three people uh, 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 talking about um, one of them, C, who is ill. Here is a conversation. Um, person A says, then have you seen the doctor or not? Have, uh, what did you say? Sorry, what did you say? Uh, then B, nothing, ah. Uh. Um, then C, uh, I tell you the doctor sees me. I tell her everything, that's all. True what? They don't know what's wrong with you. You go, sorry, you got to tell them first, right? Um, now, this is, uh, uh, as well, uh, just a, um, that was a um, bird's eye view of uh, the major functions of sentence final word from a synchronic perspective. Now, we want to explain or we want to, uh, yeah, to make sense of how come that what uh, came to be used um, in this way. Um, and we're taking now a diachronic perspective because as I mentioned already, we, we, our goal here is to uh, explain the synchronic behavior sentence final word in Singlish in terms of um, its diachronic uh, development. But we need some historical information first um, about Singapore colloquial English or Singlish. Well, this is, the, 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 I mean, the counterpart uh, of uh, Singlish is a standard, um, uh, is standard uh, Singapore uh, English, which is actually uh, held to be not very different from other international standard English varieties. Um, what we have to know about uh, 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 Singlish spoken in Singapore is that the present generations of Singaporeans is in daily contact um, with Mandarin Chinese. And Mandarin Chinese has actually uh, been promoted um, um, through this uh, campaign, uh, speak, the Speak Mandarin campaign, uh, as the um, standard Chinese lingua franca. Um, to be used among uh, the Chinese citizens um, who have various um, Chinese dialect backgrounds. Um, Mandarin Chinese has been replacing, uh, therefore, the southern dialects of Chinese because uh, this is a place where you have Hokkien Chinese, um, Hakka, Teochew, um, Cantonese as well. Uh, and these were actually southern Chinese varieties which earlier were much more prominent, much more present in Singapore um, than uh, they are now after the Speak Mandarin campaign was launched back in 1979. Now we know that Singapore was a British colony up to uh, 1963. Um, 
It is also important to point out that Bazaar Malay and Hokkien Chinese were the lingua francas in the early 20th century. And very importantly, English was only spoken by a very minor um, um, portion of the population, namely by the very upper class and British colonial masters. Actually, they say it's no more than just 2%. Um, now, scholars um, have uh, identified uh, the structure of uh, Central Sinai uh, Award in Singlish as coming from the languages that they happen to be most familiar with. So this is what Andrea Gupta, uh, back in 1992, um, uh, writes. Obviously, you know, depending on what kind of linguistic background uh, we have as scholars, um, we have particular biases, right? So uh, there have been a number of uh, opinions on where exactly um, a sentence final what uh, in Singlish originated from, and depending on uh, which languages uh, the skull is most uh, familiar with, you have <laughs> different proposals. So the major proposals in the literature are first that um, this is the result of linguistic transfer from uh, Mandarin, Hokkien, and Cantonese Chinese. Um, the second proposal is that it comes from Hokkien and Cantonese. Um, then the third one is that uh, the origins are, are um, um, to be uh, uh, found in Bazaar, Bazaar Malay and Hokkien Chinese. Uh, and then there is also a, a fourth proposal that it comes from Tamil. And in all these proposals, the underlying argument is that, um, as a matter of fact, uh, Singlish has quite a large inventory of um, particles which have indeed been borrowed uh, from some southern uh, uh, Chinese variety. And this is easy to, uh, uh, to trace uh, back uh, simply because there is a formal similarity uh, and there is also uh, uh, overlap in meaning, in function. Um, you know, speaking about the set, and it's quite a large set of emotive particles in Singlish. Hence, um, uh, it should be unlikely that Center's final word, which is another, yet another emotive particle in Singlish, came from English. I mean, if you have a whole uh, battery of uh, emotive particles, we know that they uh, have been regularly transferred from uh, um, the local uh, substratal uh, languages, uh, then why should we make an exception for what? Um, so the reasoning is it should have come either from a Chinese dialect or some other regional variety, but it should be some substratal uh, language. And the logic behind this is, of course, uh, an argument which, uh, in fact, we very often uh, we use. In, I'm sorry, we very often use in contact linguistics. We say that um, if um, I mean, uh, what has been repeated many times is most likely to, to be repeated again. Or well, this is, of course, something of a more universal um, uh, um, uh, um, significance. But um, in contact linguistics, um, we are a very, um, mm, I mean, we'll, we, we like um, thinking that if um, we have, uh, if, if we can observe a lot of uh, linguistic material uh, being uh, transferred from one particular language, then, then we are much more prone to expect that yet another and another <laughs> um, piece of uh, material will, will um, enter the replica uh, language. Um, so, um, in, in our, I mean, uh, our uh, standpoint, however, um, is uh, different from um, from uh, the one existing in the literature, um, namely that sentence final what, just like all the other emotive particles, has been uh, transferred from the substratal local varieties. Uh, and our objections uh, to this logic are actually several. Our first objection is that. Now, thinking about the argument, what has been repeated many times, um, 
or has been repeated many times, is most likely to be repeated again. Uh, we can also say that there is uh, another uh, uh, line of logic, there is a first time for everything. It also um, <clears throat> is valid in, um, in linguistics. Um, occasional items from colonial British usage have entered the language, and we know that for a fact, and certain markers of learned colonial usage have been entrenched uh, as, um, for instance, phrases like to pluck fruit from a tree. Well, this is something that you find in, in Singlish, and we know that this, this uh, came from uh, British English. Or uh, to purchase, said with a diphthong instead of a schwa on the second syllable, um, which is used um, instead of to buy. A second objection is uh, the following. Um, now, we know that there are, well, in the literature, uh, the number that, that, that is given about that is uh, something between 8 and 11. So, there are a number of emotive particles, um, pragmatic particles, they're called often too, um, which are borrowed in the narrow sense of the word uh, from um, um, Chinese varieties or other substratal varieties um, spoken in the region. And these are a, ha, what, lor, hor, na, le, ma, me. You see, it's a set of emotive particles. Um, what is considered as part of the whole set of these pragmatic particles. Uh, and um, so linguistic transfer as the cause for the existence of what seems plausible when we look at all the pragmatic particles above borrowed from southern Chinese dialects and other regional varieties at first sight, right? Because we know that there is, has been massive borrowing from the substratal varieties. However, um, at a second, <laughs> um, I mean, if we think about it, actually, what is the only pragmatic particle with a phonological shape which comes from colonial usage? So you see, I mean, um, the phonological shapes of all the other particles, they're clearly not British, they're clearly not English, right? But what is, a, is an English uh, form? Um, and obviously, it makes it different from all the rest. Its form makes it different. The other particles are clear instances of adoption of form meaning pairings from the contact language varieties. There have been a lot of studies on that. Um, and they really comply with uh, the textbook definition of what uh, borrowing is when we have adoption of both a phonological material and also meaning. So, um, Because of this difference <laughs> between what uh, and all the other emotive particles, namely the formal, um, I mean the the the, 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 uh, the, sh the phonological shape of the particle, uh, we uh, we believe that it is plausible to assume that. Um, Singlish sentence final word comes from British English and not from uh, the substratal local varieties. Most likely British English had a mediating role in the genesis and evolution of uh, Singlish sentence final word. Substrate language varieties may have also exerted some influence as they also have sentence final particles uh, with similar functions, however. But now, we also have a third objection, um, and it has to do with a closer look at what you find uh, in British English, uh, in earlier times in British English. So, well, in present-day British English, sentence final use of what is acceptable only in very restricted uh, types of context. Um, if we take a closer look at British English prior to the foundation times of Singlish, it turns out that four out of the five functions of um, Singlish sentence final what were in place already. Only the function of objection cannot be attained. Attested. So all the other, all the four functions that uh, uh, we spoke about in the beginning um, 
are actually to be found in uh, English, in British English, um, uh, from uh, I mean, going back to as we will see um, the uh, 18th, 19th century, um, and uh, it is only the objection function which is um, uh, something that we only come across um, in uh, Singlish. Um, The same four functions of central final what, uh, center's final what in British English. Um, uh, oh, excuse me. Um, here, I need to ask you to take a look at the handout. Um, the, the examples from one to four, uh, as you can see, are from uh, British English prior to the foundation times of Singlish. Um, I don't know if, if I ask you right away, um, or in what kind of context uh, would you use sentence final what in, uh, in modern British English? Our informants tell us that uh, it is actually, it sounds very, very posh and it also sounds like a very pseudo upper uh, class um, in modern uh, British English. Right. Um, um, our American English informants uh, tell us, oh, this doesn't exist in American English, although we actually, we found a couple of examples of sentence final word uh, used uh, in the contemporary uh, corpus, sorry, in the corpus of contemporary um, American English. Um, however, when we talk, I mean, we have the examples there, right, in the corpus, but when we ask uh, colleagues uh, from the States, they say, oh, oh, this is certainly because uh, people here are imitating these posh uh, British English speakers. Or um, others say, well, look, I actually listen to the example on the, you know, uh, because you can also uh, listen to, to these examples in Kauka, but uh, I'm 100% sure that this lady here who uses uh, what at the end of the sentence, actually she, um, she has been distracted by somebody else in the room and she, she just turning to, to that other person. This is not part of her utterance, right? So I mean, American English speakers have that strong an attitude against um, sentence final what being used uh, in authentic American speech. Uh, but please take a look at the handout uh, and the first four examples come from, uh, as you can see, um, well, the first one is 18th century. We see um, uh, what uses a mitigator. Then um, the next one is uh, again the beginning of the 18th century. Here we have appeal for agreement or solidarity. We also have the function of discontent um, going back to the uh, 18th century, second half of 18th century. Uh, as an emphasis, uh, it could also be used as an emphasis, uh, and we see an example from the 18th century. And mind you, this is um, not only um, you know, British English prior to the foundation times, but also later on, um, uh, British English contemporaneous with Singlish. There again, uh, we see um, uh, uses of uh, what at the end of the sentence, um, fulfilling four of the five functions uh, we talked about. Um, so our proposal is actually that uh, the Singlish sentence final what uh, should be regarded um, as the continuation of a development which started in the non-local lexifile language, British English. Uh, and um, we propose uh, a four-stage development um, of uh, what uh, to be traced back to the foundation time of the uh, Singlish dialect, uh, where uh, stage, I mean, the initial stage, the, the origins is actually uh, interrogative uh, questions, interrogative clauses. Then um, at, a f at the next stage, you have rhetorical question of discontent. Um, at the next stage, uh, 
discourse marker of discontent. Uh, and then at the final stage, uh, which is not reached in uh, British English, but in Singlish, um, it is objection marker. So that's our proposal. And um, in fact, um, you can, I mean, this particular branch of development of interrogative clauses uh, ultimately into objection uh, marker, uh, what is an objection marker, is uh, only one branch of a branching development of uh, interrogative what, uh, which you can see on the second page of, uh, of your handout. Um, so what I'm going to talk about now in the rest of, the, of this presentation is uh, namely one, the lowest uh, branch of the development that you have graphically represented in the second, on the second page of, um, of your handout. Um, and this lowest uh, branch starts with interrogative clauses. Um, right, so you can, you can see the lowest branch. So Stage zero, ground zero, stage zero, uh, interrogative question. Uh, then at the next stage, it is a rhetorical question of discontent. An example of that could be, for instance, you have um, a conversation between uh, father and son, uh, and the context is uh, son was dri driving drunk and crashed into a tree. And then uh, here is a rhetorical question of discontent that a father could come up with very naturally. What the hell were you thinking, right? So obviously this is uh, not, uh, not something that the father is expecting an answer uh, uh, for. It's a rhetorical question, uh, beginning with what? Now, um, at stage two, we have uh, a discourse marker of discontent. It, not a rhetorical question, but a disc discourse marker of discontent, uh, where only the what word of the clause remains and the rest is omitted. Um, here is an example which comes from Singlish. Uh, this is um, an interview with a national serviceman. Um, so we have the interviewer, we have the um, uh, national serviceman, and the interviewer says, Suppose uh, you were a millionaire and passed away, leaving a fortune for your children. Now, you were the one to bring up. The, sorry. Now, you were the one to bring up this fortune, not your children. So, uh, do you think it is fair for the government to tax your children heavily on the inheritance? Well, my intonation contour is not the right one here, <laughs> right? But, but you, you, get the, you, you get the meaning, right? Um, now, the national serviceman, completely taken by surprise by the idea, no, that must never happen. This is your money, what? The government should not tax anything at all. Um, so here we have what as a discourse marker of discontent. Um, the sentence final what in Singlish uh, results from the uh, phonological erosion of the interrogative exclamatory construction. Um, something like, uh, what could you say again? What could, it, what, <laughs> what could you say against that? Or what are you thinking? Or what were you thinking? Or what do you expect? Right, you, you could very well imagine a, a rhetorical questions like that, which um, uh, rhetorical questions of discontent, which uh, um, got phonologically eroded so that only the first uh, element, the what, remains. And in some languages, the discourse marker of discontent is a fixed idiomatic expression which really has the structure of a clause beginning with the interrogative what. So this is what gives us the right, or the justification actually, to, um, 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 to, uh, um, to have this idea, I mean, to, 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 to propose that um, uh, rhetorical questions of 
discontent may give rise naturally to discourse markers of discontent. And such examples are uh, such examples where the, um, the morphological structure of the discourse marker um, very transparently manifests uh, the structure of an earlier clause. So uh, we do have such examples, and, and we actually have examples from uh, languages as different uh, genetically and geographically as Bulgarian, which happens to be my own mother tongue, and Korean, which happens to be the, the mother tongue of one of my co-authors. Um, so now I need to ask you to take a look at uh, the examples on the, hand, on the handout, examples 9 and 10, um, where from Bulgarian and Korean, uh, where the discourse marker of a discontent is a fixed idiomatic expression um, uh, having the structure of a clause um, which begins with interrogative what. So um, that's what gives us the right, as I said, to um, um, argue that rhetorical questions of discontent uh, naturally develop into discourse markers of discontent. And in fact, let's take a look at the English um, expression, uh, well, at the English um, example that we have here. Are we the, sorry, <laughs> are we the, no, are you? <laughs> I think you can, uh, you, you, you can, uh, who shall I? Rachel, would you please read this aloud? <laughs> <laughs> Are you the Queen of England or what? <laughs> okay, good. So, um, um, well, it, it seems to us that here we're dealing with two rhetorical clauses which were combined, and the second of these um, is something like, uh, what are you thinking? What were you thinking? Right? It is, um, it is discontent in some sense, right? And due to high frequency uh, and accordingly high predictability, only the initial interrogative uh, WH element of the second clause remained being preceded by the conjunction or, and the rest of the second clause was omitted. Well, this is an example from English, uh, or what? Uh, Lutus here. Uh, and he knows very well that in German we also, oh, Frederike, of course, <laughs> in German we also have oder was yeah. in very, very similar context. And uh, this really um, uh, seems to happen in a number of languages. You also have it in, in colloquial French. Um, you see how in colloquial French, if you use what at the end, uh, oh, well, <laughs> I have somebody to ask here too. Would you please? There are many people here, okay. <laughs> anyway, so as you can see, um, in colloquial French, uh, using what at the end of, uh, of a sentence like this sounds very natural as well. And here again, it expresses discontent. This has been actually very nicely studied by uh, Kate Beeching. I mean, French. Um, well, here we have an example from um, um, a Korean. Maybe I'll have to skip that. Um, where you can see Korean very nicely shows how uh, it is in fact possible to um, fuse um, a sentence uh, final word to a preceding interrogative clause via what the authors here, uh, um, Ku and uh, Lee, refer to as pragmaticalization, so that uh, you get to a sentence final particle of discontent. So that's an even further development of a discourse marker of discontent, a uh, very important one, um, um, uh, and uh, it even adds uh, something new to the verbal um, uh, morphology of of Korean, but I don't think that we have enough time to discuss this in detail now. Okay, um, now the next stage, once we've reached the stage of a discourse mar marker of discontent, at the next stage we have a branching development. We can either go uh, the way, uh, you know, to, um, to the um, objection use, Right, or emphatic markers. But here we will be uh, focusing on um, the development 
uh, from discourse marker of discontent to general objection marker. So that's what we are um, uh, taking a closer look now, discourse marker of discontent to objection marker. Uh, well, this um, uh, development uh, is uh, accompanied by uh, the process of generalization, where due to the frequency of use, the meaning of a discourse marker of discontent fades out, uh, and um, it serves to indicate a general objection to something in the discourse situation. Um, here is an example, uh, again from uh, Singlish. Uh, we have A and B, and uh, these are uh, two uh, people, actually they're students, uh, trying to find their way from one building on campus to another. Well, I don't know about this campus here, but I can tell you the campus in Düsseldorf is horrible. It, it, it really, <laughs> you feel lost almost all the time. Um, so the first student says, uh, that way cannot la. Well, la is one of these uh, emotive particles in Singlish, you know, which is a whole set uh, uh, of pragmatic emotive particles in, sing uh, in Singlish. And then the second, I mean, the other uh, student says, can what? Right? Uh, B uses what to refute or to reject the previous utterance. And uh, this is a general indication of objection by the speaker to relevant utterances or actions. Now, what is unexpected for us as students of um, uh, contact linguistics, right, is um, the following observation that we can make. Interrogative what has developed further, it has developed one step further, one stage further in the replica language. Well, replica language, well, I assume that, uh, actually this is uh, terminology going back to Weinreich, uh, replica language and model language. Model is the language which gives <laughs> the donor uh, and replica is the language which receives the linguistic material in a, a language contact situation. So, interrogative what has developed further in the replica language, which in this particular case is Singlish, than in the model language. That is to say, British English, the lexifier, does not have what used at the end of the sentence as a marker of objection, but you have it in Singlish, which is the replica language, right? And this is actually unexpected. Um, Singlish speakers not only replicate stage one and stage two of the development that started in, in the lexifier language, we argue, and thus uh, Singlish speakers recapitulate the whole historical path in the model language, namely the lexifier, British English, in fact, Singlish speakers go a step further. They have reached, so to speak, stage three, namely the, the objection uh, marker stage. And at stage three, uh, as uh, we uh, pointed that out already, um, what functions as a pragmatic particle with a general meaning of speaker's rejection to something um, in the context. So this is contradiction to what has been considered to be a well-established fact in contact linguistics, namely that the language change process in the model language is, as a rule, more advanced than the one in the replica language. So we should expect, actually, that objection should appear, objection, the objection function should have appeared in the model language and lexifier, in the lexifier, uh, and Singlish should have taken only, you know, the, the first uh, stages, or all of them, but, but certainly not further than uh, what you have in the model language. Um, one of my co-authors, um, Debbie uh, um, uh, Ziegler, uh, attributed cases like this to communicative pressures inherent to the very dynamics of the language contact situation. Uh, she uses the term hypergrammaticalization in uh, Singapore. Uh, then she, she makes uh, uh, an even stronger uh, argument for that in uh, her more recent publication, Replica Grammaticalizations as Recapitulation. And in fact, there is also a recent study by um, Vima and Verkli, 
Björn Wiemer and Berghard uh, Weltli, uh, 2012, who also give examples for a more advanced stage of contact-induced language change in the replica than in the model language. That is to say, things are happening. I mean, new, new observations, new uh, conclusions, new analyses are um, there now in uh, contact linguistics. And uh, what we find here in this particular study uh, is in support of these uh, newly made observations. Um, now, the theoretical implications of our study. We may very well be dealing with the bias of analysts of language depending on what their language background is. This might be due to the emblematic function of language. Singapore colloquial English has colonial English as the lexify language. The recognition or appreciation of substratist language identity in the ongoing attempt to eradicate Singapore colloquial English might be another source for bias. One can expect bias towards overweighting the influence of either pre-colonial language varieties spoken in the region like Malay, Cantonese, Hokkien, or Mandarin Chinese instead of the multifar multifarious Chinese dialects once spoken on the island. In some cases, the exact source of a particular construction becomes more and more difficult to trace. Scholars have a tendency to associate a certain usage with whatever language is most familiar to them. And I have to say, the present study <laughs> does not claim to be an exception in this regard, as you can see, obvious. <laughs> obviously. <clears throat> Yet, in terms of its origins, the use of sentence final what has so far remained inconclusive in much of the literature to date. And to us, on the basis of the arguments that I pointed out here, um, the lexifier British English appears to be the most plausible source. Our reasons for this are the following. First, the absence of a formal similarity with any of the substrate Chinese dialect, dialects, ruling out borrowed forms. And two, the curious affinities with earlier functions of a similar now archaic um, utterance final discourse marker in British English. Those now archaic utterance final discourse markers could have been transferred in a situation resembling the retentionist contact situations described by Peach um, in the development of uh, Hiberno English, for example. Um, so, okay. Uh, I'm really being on time this time. <laughs> um, our conclusions are um, that we need not look for the source of Singapore colloquial English uh, centers final what in the local uh, substratal uh, varieties um, in Singapore. The process uh, that brought about its existence originated in the lexify language. Uh, we argue, colonial uh, British English. Uh, because four of the five major functions of sentence final word were already in place in the lexify language in the pre-contact period, as well as during the foundation period of Singapore, uh, colloquial English. Well, thank you very much. I'd be happy to take your questions if you have some. <coughs> oh, okay. So, um, so it's interesting that the, the origin of what you said comes from English, but do you think that the reason that it's continued to be used, well, it's kind of died out um, in other dialects in English, like in mine, I'm American, I've never heard of it, um, do you think it could have been kind of 
maintained due to the fact that the substrates, um, like Chinese, kind of have similar structures, um, like the different particles at the end? Do you think that could have Absolutely, been absolutely. I, uh, I certainly think that it is important that, uh, you know, Singlish uh, is uh, a high contact variety and that Singlish um, uh, language users are in contact with uh, these substratal languages. And certainly uh, the fact that, uh, you know, there exist uh, other emotive particles used at the end of the um, utterance, um, uh, it has enhanced um, the entrenchment of a sentence uh, final word. Um, it's just that uh, uh, what is different from, from the rest. In fact, um, Cantonese um, uh, Chinese has been uh, claimed a number of times to be the origins of this particular uh, use of what, uh, also because uh, there is a, uh, a particle in Cantonese which is very near, it is a near homophone, it is what? Right. However, there is a difference phonologically because uh, in the Cantonese form, uh, what you have, the vowel that you have um, is a mid-back rounded vowel, whereas in the Singlish um, uh, uh, what, which is actually pronounced not what, not the way that I pronounce it, I'm not good at that, it's what or what. There are a number of pronunciations. However, um, most of the time, the vowel uh, in the Singlish, what uh, is um, it is a, a, a central, open, unrounded uh, uh, vowel, and very importantly, most of the time with Singlish final what um, you have um, you have a dentalized, uh, 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 an unreleased dentalized uh, stop, um, but not not in, in the Cantonese uh, uh, form. And moreover, if you compare the functions of the Cantonese uh, form and, and the uh, Singlish one, um, uh, they're very different. They're much more different than similar simply because the Cantonese one um, stands for uh, what they refer to as a noteworthy discovery. Right. It's, it's a bit different from what we have been discussing here. But uh, I think this is a very good point, yes. Uh, the presence uh, of, uh, I mean, the existence of um, similarly functioning particles in, in the local varieties is certainly an additional factor. However, we're talking here about the origins, right, of, um, of this particular particle. <coughs> okay, no? um, yes, please. I was wondering if you've looked up the etymology of the Singlish word one. Yeah. Because that's also under debate where they say yes. it comes from English because it has similar properties of the English use of one. But yeah. then that's put under doubt because it's also got similar properties, in fact, more similar properties yeah. to the Chinese particle dead. Yeah, yeah, the associative as well. Mm -hmm. So it could be that maybe the what in sing Singlish yeah. is a mix between the lectifier and the substrate. Uh huh. Okay, uh, only it is not exactly clear to me. Um, I mean, there is very interesting literature on one, uh, especially as a marker of the relative clause. You have it also as a double double marking of the relative clause in Singlish. Um, but uh, it is not exactly clear to me um, uh, how you relate the use of one to uh, the functions that we discussed here. I mean, the uh, how how I'm does it? Functions. You're I'm saying, saying about the form, yeah. Of one, right. You can trace it to English, but you can't right. just trace it to English. Yeah. So you might be, if you were just looking at one, you might be tempted to think that it's a continuation of the process that happens in English. Yeah. But actually, it was also influenced by Chinese. So you're saying that yeah. what is a continuation of the process that happened in English. Right. But perhaps it's. Also yeah, I get your point. Chinese. 
Oh yeah, this makes perfect sense to me. This makes absolutely perfect sense because you know the very fact that we do not have it uh, in in British English, but we have it in Singlish, and we know for a fact that Singlish is in, is in intense contact with the Chinese varieties. Uh, th this is a very good point, and it makes perfect sense. Yeah. So basically, what you're saying is uh, that most likely, and in, and this, I catch myself using the expression, in fact, all the time. <laughs> Apologies for that. Um, uh, so uh, it is uh, worthwhile, it's certainly, it is wor a worthwhile study to see exactly uh, uh, which, uh, which functions of which particles uh, could have uh, brought about the rise of this particular function, the objection function, in the case of um, of what? Well, thank you very much for this. Thank you. <coughs> thank you. I think, I think my question follows to the other yeah. ones. I'm, I'm curious, I think, in your use between sentence final and utterance final. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I was very uh, sloppy yes. here. Yes. I was I very, very sloppy. And I'm yeah. to take you up on that because yeah. it, it seems to me one thing actually would be really, really nice if to have, to have more intonation data because the notion of sentence is it's yeah. a tricky one to yeah. have. Yeah. But if you look at yeah. your English data, yeah. it's interesting because often people use punctuation to sort of mirror intonation. Mm -hmm. And I think yeah. all of the examples you have have a clear orthographic segmentation between yeah. the preceding stretch sentence yeah. clause yeah. and the what element. Yeah. So actually, I think the English examples are not at all clear evidence that this is sentence final or indeed even utterance final, because it may well be an utterance. And then another utterance, like an adverb exclamation type, type usage of what, mm -hmm. yeah. which then gets reanalyzed in the Singlish mm -hmm. based on precisely the substrate influence we yes. have, because there you have yes. systems which have sentence final mm -hmm. particles. So you take the substance of what, but yeah. reinterpret that now really as a sentence final particle. Yeah. And that then allows you to treat it, and then precisely, that gets to the earlier mm -hmm. question, then all, what you're looking for is in one of the, of the subset languages, yeah. the function of semantics, which has to shift to the object, completely irrespective of the form. So yeah. it's just the form which gets taken over by English, but then yeah. gets integrated with the system yeah. which is based on the subject, and only yeah. then becomes a sentence final particle. Yeah. But in English, you would never have to postulate either sentence final or on these other final. Yeah. Mm. So, are you saying, okay, <laughs> that's a hard one. <laughs> are, you, are you saying that um, the English examples, because any, the one that, that uh, you have here, for example, from one to, uh, to four, or then, to, you know, the first nine examples, um, uh, well, we have those uh, in an orthographic form, right? So are you saying that uh, you, you wouldn't interpret these examples the way that we have interpreted them? I think so. I mm -hmm. think the first one is yeah. what's what. So this yeah. is the or what, which we still have. Mm -hmm. The second one has a semicolon. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's, you know, let's say it's a pause. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. The third mm -hmm. one has a dash, yeah. which mm -hmm. again is a pause. Then the next one is a semicolon again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And actually this has it's a very nice parallelism. So this has. Yes, this is my wish. What? Marta will convey me privately into the cup. It's delightful. <laughs> the what actually aligns with the delight. Right? Uh -huh. um, then you have Kai. Full stop. Clearly, this is a different yeah. information. Yeah. Six, you have again the long dash. Seven, you have a dash and then the A and the comma what? And then eight, you have a comma. And that all of them, you will find that there's a clear orthographic representation of at least the pause. Oh, I see what you mean. Uh, um, um, well, in the um, in the British um, yeah. in the British English examples, um, the sentence final what is not. I mean, it's not um, it's not as established uh, as it is in Singlish because in Singlish the prosody uh, is very different. You know, yes. you're right. The prosody is absolutely different. It is an entrenched usage in Singlish, whereas in English, um, you're right. Things are not as established, and things are much more dependent on the context. You know, this is clear. Um, however. Um, wouldn't you, um, how would you, uh, um, but what, how would you uh, interpret 
um, the use of what, let's say, in the first example. Um, for you, it is problematic to consider it as a marker of mitigation, like you've said something. Okay, this is obviously an exclamation, right? Uh, my dear friend, but what? Well, this happens before the father's face. And mitigation is again, you know, it's like, I'm ashamed for having said that, or I'm ashamed I have to say that, right? Uh, it is true, in, 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 in Singlish, you don't have to use the exclamation mark. In English, usually you have, you know, we either have a question mark, um, or you have, an, um, you know, the exclamation mark. This is true. Uh, but do you have a serious problem with treating what, for instance, in the first sentence, as a mitigation marker? I, I, I'm not sure about the function. Yeah. I think it would be nice to have more context, actually. I'm more yeah. concerned about the structure. And yeah. here, I think, this is, this is Brum. This is a person named, presumably, which is Brum? <laughs> what does it mean? <laughs> Let's say it's a name. Short Birmingham, but yeah. Oh, like in Brummie. Oh, OK, Birmingham. So it's a city. And huh? then, oh, oh, my dear friend, <laughs> exclamation. But what? All this happened, actually, for me, that goes with the next one. But what? All this happens, all this happened before the father's face is a subjunctive? It happened? Let's say it's a subjunctive. Well, we're um, talking about 1796, you know? It's, yes, a, it's yeah, a very yeah, so old example. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. Um, so, okay, Luz, I, so I, I, I can get your point. I, I can get your point. Yeah, I get your point. I, I, I have what some has, think, yeah, but yeah. I'm, I'm not convinced that but what yeah. really is sentence final or indeed utterance final. Yeah. It's either an independence utterance or it goes with the, so it's, or, or it's utterance initial going with what follows, I think. Yeah, I, I can see your point. Um, all right, so basically uh, you're, you're calling into question uh, our interpretation of the earlier uh, uses of what at the end of the sentence yes. in British English. Yes. Right. Um, yes, Peter. I think this, you, may, you, you, you have to be careful drawing yeah. uh, <coughs> too much conclusions. Um, based on the punctuation, the variations in punctuation. Oh, yeah, that's another because, point. Because um, yeah. this is a non-standard feature of English, and yeah. people writing may not know how to deal with it. The only one that <coughs> I can relate to is the kind of Terry Thomas uh, number eight, um, in which there is no intonation break. It's jolly fine shooting, what? And there's no, it's not, jolly fine shooting, what? No, it's not, that's not possible at all. Yeah. It has to run on exactly, so. Yeah, although there is a comma here, and we were just taking yeah, this up. But, but you're right, writing, the punctuation. writing a form that's not standard English. Yeah, absolutely, you're absolutely to, right. To write yeah. It. That's a possible hypothesis yeah. to counter what Professor Martin is suggesting. <laughs> Yeah. So you're being very helpful here. <laughs> I have the devil's advocate. Yes. <laughs> Jolly good topic. Jolly good topic, what? <laughs> yeah. Yes, please. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. I'm very, um, my question is rather simple. And yes. My God, uh, what a nice, <laughs> nice question. Um, of course, I'm aware that in China you have over 600 Sinitic varieties. Um, so, uh, no, no, actually, Cantonese Chinese is what. Uh, but, but you know, people, not only me, also other people, other colleagues are being very sloppy in the, uh, when you write about, uh, you know, Chinese varieties. So, what I meant here is Cantonese Chinese. Okay. Yeah. I was going to raise exactly yes. the same question. I think that yeah. many linguists these days would refer to these as Sinitic languages. Sinitic languages. And avoid yeah. entirely the term Chinese dialect. So yeah. I, I suggest you uh, okay. do some. Um, Being very helpful again, your... Peter. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, yes, I agree, really. I mean, and of course, uh, the area hasn't been. Uh, properly investig investigated until recently, but we have Hilary Chappelle now and other people yeah. who have done excellent research on that. Uh, um, who should I take now? <laughs> Thank you. Yes, Frederick. Yeah. <laughs> it's actually a dumb question because I'm not familiar with um, those proponents um, the theory that say that 
there has to be arrested development of a kind. So once the replica language has adopted something, it's not supposed to change. And I, I, I think it should be fairly easy to find counterexamples mm -hmm. of that. I mean, if I think about the Frenches of Africa, for instance, yeah. um, there are uh, yeah. you know, many, many examples, actually, of things that are seemingly French, yeah. but, but that, that have had their own development yeah. coaxed along by the substrate languages. So yes, I was wondering yes. about a but this is reason to assume yeah. that this model, and yeah. also I wanted to ask you about Zebra, Zebra Siegler's work. Yes. And is that yeah. the only reason that she calls this hypergrammaticalization? Because, for because me, it looks to like, like yeah. plain grammaticalization. You know, yeah. Yeah. it's yeah. only because uh, <coughs> I mean, you know, things grammaticalize from discourse, and it's just yeah. that this particular discourse yes. happens to be multilingual. But uh, you know, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 I perfectly agree with you. Mm -hmm. However, going back to the history of contact mm -hmm. linguistics, you know, in the first yeah. years, well, Bent and myself included, uh, and, and we ha were following here also other people, mm -hmm. you know, the, the traditional assumption is that if you have a replication of a particular process from a model language, mm -hmm. then in the model language it is much longer, much more advanced process. And, and the, the replica language is, you know, somehow lagging behind. But there has come uh, new research, and obviously the one, that, I mean, what you're talking about, mm -hmm. uh, this adds to this new um, uh, body of data, uh, which just shows that that's a <laughs> old Schnee from gestern. <laughs> yeah. but following up on that yes. question, if I may, um, it would be interesting to, to see um, to what extent what behaves differently in, in the discourse of speakers who are more in contact with Semitic languages or more in contact with uh, Singapore Standard English or other varieties of English. Oh, that will be very interesting. Yeah. I agree. I agree. And then we can isolate, you know, different factors mm -hmm. about the... Yeah, that's true. That's a very, that would be a sophisticated continuation <laughs> of the study. But, but as you can see, we have to, to do our homework uh, with some basic things there. Mm -hmm. um, for example, you know, the two of you here, <laughs> um, the standpoint about um, how seriously uh, should one uh, take the, the prosody, the, the way that we find it, uh, and actually, we have to, to look more at examples. Um, well, but if you're dealing with earlier stages of the language, and if you do not have any spoken language, what do you do? You have uh, this as a, you know, it's the established opinion that uh, prosody can be very misleading, especially when it uh, comes to earlier historical attestations, simply because people didn't know how to point this. So we have a, a serious methodological problem. Yes? They're writing what they think. Uh, 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 exactly. What they, yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. Conventions coming in and we from Yeah. Yes, yes, it's really hard. <coughs> but on that note, oh no, there's a lot of questions, so maybe. Um, just a couple of comments. Um, your, your earlier points about the transition with Mandarin, the Speak Mandarin campaign. Yes. My understanding from Lisa Lim is that yeah. um, the, the result of the Speak Mandarin campaign is not a switch from speaking Hokkien, Cantonese, Hakka yeah. to Mandarin, it's yeah. to speaking English. So yeah. she shows, in if you look at the, at the uh, census figures, yeah. 70% of the ethnic Chinese community spoke, like 30 years ago, spoke various Chinese dialects, so yeah. called. Mm -hmm. And now, um, and 30% spoke English, and now it's 30% speak Mandarin and 70% speak English. So That's right, yeah. The shift has actually been to English, not to yes, Mandarin that, at all. Yes. And the impact of the, mm. of the Singaporean government policy has been to actually reduce the amount of Chinese that's being spoken. Yeah. Um, by all communities. Yes. And the second comment would be that um, the models for in in the Singaporean context 
I don't think the models were just upper class British. People, yeah, yeah. Because there's a, there was a whole group of compadors who who were um, actually native, ended up being native English speaking, who were the interface between the colonial office and and the local communities. Yeah. So Lisa's um, Lisa Lim, I yeah. may know. Her. I know, I know. Yeah. Her grandfather was a native speaker of English. Um, yeah. Because he'd been employed, his father had been employed by the government to work as a compador, um, you know, trading person. So yeah. she actually comes from, from several generations of native speakers of English. Yeah. And I think that's the interface, and probably through school teaching and that kind of thing, you've got the spread of, of Singaporean English, not necessarily from the colonial uh, level. So you have to be careful, the story has to be a little more articulated about yeah. where this, yeah. these things come from. Yes, there are different. Also, Andrea Gupta says that um, Singapore English uh, originated very late, like at the beginning of the 20th century. In the beginning of the 20th century, in the schools of, you know, the schools, I forget the, the exact phrase now, but there are different opinions on when and where exactly mm -hmm. Singlish arose. As for your first question, um, the Speak Mandarin, uh, Speak Mandarin campaign, um, which started in 1979, just a moment. Um, th um, this is uh, about using Mandarin Chinese as a lingua franca mm -hmm. among the Chinese, yeah. right? Yeah. But it's not about you know eliminating English or, or anything like that. It's just that they should no, no, no. Yeah. My point was yes. that it was to push the use of Chinese Mandarin as the lingua franca. Yes. But the effect was uh -huh. that English became the lingua franca. I, 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 see, I see your point now. Yeah, OK, OK. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, uh, Julia. An interesting yes. development just in the last week or so, I've heard a report that the Singapore government decided now to to promote Singlish. Uh, I know, like August that. last Chinese, year, Chinese absolutely, absolutely. August last year, Singlish was um, uh, officially celebrated as now the new, I mean, they have several, I think, it is the fifth official language. So it's a, it's a major event. <laughs> yeah. On that note, thank you, Tanya, again. Thank you, thank you very much. This was very helpful. Thank <laughs> you.